The lecturer in this segment on how to estimate embedding parameters is Joshua Garland, who was the teaching assistant for this course the first time it was offered. In the last two sections, we've talked about the theory and mechanics of delay court embedding. In this section, we'll talk about performing delay court embedding in practice and a few of the methods for doing that. In this discussion, we'll sweep this detail under the rug. That is, we'll assume that the measured quantity is a smooth generic function of at least one of the state variables, and we'll assume it's uniformly sampled in time. For the examples I'll be showing you, this was the case. Recall that in practice, the first step of delay court embedding is to construct a data comb, and this means selecting tau, which is the time delay, and m, which is the embedding dimension. As is common, we will start this by selecting tau. Remember that tau is the amount of space between each tooth in the data comb. And also remember that while tau, as long as it's positive, should not have an effect on the embedding, it has a very drastic effect numerically on the embedding because of a process called overfolding. Let's begin by watching a video where we fix m, that is the embedding dimension, and we increase tau at every frame of the movie. So when watching this video, every time that you see the frame change, tau has been increased by one. We start with a tau of one, and we'll go to a tau of 150. As you can see, very early on, the embedding looked a lot like the Lorenz attractor. But then what happened was the attractor folded in on itself. We'll get back to what this means. As you continue to increase the delay, the attractor continues to fold on itself over and over. There are two interesting things to note here. In theory, each of these objects are topologically equivalent. That is, each of these have two holes, for example. However, as you can see, the geometry of these objects are very, very different, and visually they look very different to us. What you can also see is that, while topologically these things might be the same, it is easy to imagine, if these are real noisy data points, that these later objects could be much more overcomplicated than they need to be, giving you false results because of numerical complications, not because of mathematics. This brings up an interesting point. If you did not know that you're measuring the Lorenz attractor, for example, how would you know which of these attractors was the least complicated? That is, if you did not know you're looking for the Lorenz attractor, how would you know, in an experimental framework, if one of these later, more visually complicated attractors is actually the first time the dynamics was unfolded? This is a real challenge in practice. To tackle this problem, let's take a step back and think about this from a linear perspective. This is often dangerous in a nonlinear setting, but I think this gives us a nice jumping point to pick tau in practice. To begin this discussion, let's just start with R2. So we're going to think about two-dimensional reconstructions. We'll continue with this two-dimensional version for both the linear discussion we're about to talk about, which is just an example to help you better understand what we're trying to get at with the nonlinear version. And we'll also use a two-dimensional example when we're talking about selecting tau in the nonlinear case. To begin, think about two linearly independent vectors who span R2. As linear algebra is not a prerequisite for this course, think about it like this. This arrow can be represented by the vector 0, 1. This arrow can be represented by the vector 1, 0. These two vectors form what are called basis vectors for the plane R2, which is just the real valued plane, because if you select any vector in R2, you can rewrite that vector in a linear combination of these two vectors. So for example, if I pick up the vector AB in R2, I can rewrite that as A times 1, 0 plus B times 0, 1, which will recover AB. If you also check the linear independence condition of a basis, which we will not cover, you can see that these two vectors form a basis for R2. What takes a little bit more faith is that any two vectors that don't point in the exact same direction, so any of these vectors, for example, would also form a basis of R2. As long as the two vectors aren't pointing in the exact same direction, the easiest way to think about this special case is to imagine if these two vectors both pointed in the exact same direction, even if one was a little bit shorter or longer than the other. In this case, we can't recover anything in the x direction. So if we wanted to reconstruct the vector AB as a linear combination of these two vectors, there's no way that we could get that A to work because both the X coordinates on these two vectors are both zero. However, if one of these vectors was just slightly different, for example, this, and this would allow us to again span R2. In a linear sense, this explains the tau greater than zero requirement of the Tockens theorem. As long as these two vectors don't point in the same direction, then they will form a linear basis for R2. 
Similarly, by choosing tau greater than zero in the delay court embedding process, you're effectively forming a nonlinear basis to reconstruct the attractor with. This also brings out a very interesting practical point. While these two vectors are technically linearly independent, you could imagine if that gap between the two vectors was small enough, these two vectors might actually be numerically linearly dependent. That is, they may be close enough that to a computer, these two vectors look like they're the same vector. This really gets at one of the practical, not theoretical requirements in choosing tau. Very small tau can form the nonlinear basis used to reconstruct the attractor to seem dependent. Effectively, if tau is not chosen large enough due to numerical error and effects of finite data length, the nonlinear basis that you choose can actually be numerically dependent. If we go back to the linear analogy, this would mean that if we chose a tau too small due to numerical error, the basis vectors would not be able to reach all directions of the reconstructed space, just like these two vectors were not able to reach the x direction. So choosing a very small tau is not generally the best idea. So this gets at a tactic for choosing tau, or the time delay. We want to choose the time delay such that the basis vectors are maximally independent in some sense. If we chose the two vectors so that they looked like this, then they would have the least amount of dependence on each other, and then we'd make sure that even if the computer had a very bad error, these vectors would still form a basis and be able to reach all directions of the reconstructed space. So some of you may be thinking, if you just picked the first zero of an autocorrelation function on this time series, that would give you the first tau at which there is linear independence between these two vectors. And this would work great if we were working with linear dynamics. But an autocorrelation function would ignore any nonlinear correlations that occurred between these two vectors. And so for this reason, using autocorrelation, or the first zero of the autocorrelation function, is not always the best idea. But regardless, this idea is still used in practice. The idea of why to choose the first zero is very interesting. Imagine if I took this vector and I twisted it around by two pi and I landed back in this position. This can be thought of as a linear analogy for why the overfolding process occurs in delay court embedding. You've effectively allowed this axis to wrap around on itself. While this wrapped around set of basis vectors still grants you independence, it's more complicated than it needs to be and can cause numerical error in the practical case. So it should be clear from this discussion that we want to select basis vectors which are as independent as possible while not wrapping the system around on itself. We can't use the autocorrelation function because this is a linear statistic which doesn't get at any of the nonlinear correlations present in nonlinear dynamics. In the paper, Independent Coordinates for Strand Attractors from Mutual Information, Fraser and Sweeney pr proposed a method to get what they called generally independent basis vectors. To fully understand this standard technique takes a good amount of information theory, in particular a good understanding of mutual information. Because information theory is not a prerequisite of this course, I'm going to weigh heavily on the linear discussion we just had. One way to think about independence between vectors is to think about each coordinate sharing the least amount of information with the other coordinates. So for example, these two vectors share less information in their coordinates than these two vectors, for example. So we can think about these two vectors as sharing the least amount of information between coordinates. From an information theoretic sense, we can think about this as the coordinates in the delay vector having the least amount of shared information. This is called mutual information in the literature. So for this reason, if we wanted to receive generally independent coordinates, we could calculate the mutual information between x of t and x of t minus tau, which are two of the coordinates in the delay vector. If we then plotted mutual information between x of t and x of t minus tau versus tau and picked the first minimum of this curve, this tau would provide coordinates which shared the least amount of information. That is, this would result in delay vectors whose coordinates were generally independent. This is precisely the standard method for choosing tau. Choosing the first minimum rather than a later minimum is to avoid overfolding of the dynamics. Choosing a later minimum of the mutual information curve causes the dynamics in most cases, but not all, to overfold. It's worth mentioning that choosing the first minimum of mutual information is not the only heuristic people use with this curve. For example, some people say that you should use the second minimum of the mutual information curve. And this minimizes the shared information between coordinates, but allows enough lag between the coordinates to unfold the dynamics more fully. Also, there are a group of people which argue that this is the wrong heuristic completely, and you should actually maximize the shared information between coordinates. This would mean choosing one of these two red arrows. When people use this heuristic, they would choose the first maximum of the mutual information curve. This would allow you to get away from the small tau, creating numerical dependence, but it would also allow a maximization of shared information between coordinates.
All of these, however, are just heuristics for estimating tau. Whether you choose tau as the first or second minimum, or even the first maximum of mutual information, these are simply heuristics aimed at estimating what will give you the best reconstruction. But these have no theoretical guarantees and have no relations to Tawkins' theorem whatsoever. As far as Tawkins is concerned, choosing any tau greater than zero is sufficient. These are simply numerical heuristics for doing this. There are dozens of these heuristics in the literature, and if you're interested in delay coordinate embedding, I suggest going through the literature and looking at some of the other methods to see if they're more appropriate for your application. I have found in my personal research that choice of tau is very application specific. That is a tau that's good for forecasting is not a good tau for estimating dynamical invariance and so forth. So for the purposes of this course, when we estimate tau for delay coordinate embedding, we choose the first minimum of the lagged mutual information. As a quick aside, however, it is worth mentioning that not all signals have a first minimum of mutual information. For example, an autoregressive signal will never have a minimum of mutual information, but they'll just tail off to infinity. So this heuristic is not useful for all time series. However, the time series we'll be using in this course will have a first minimum. It's just something to be aware of. There's a great time series analysis tool called Tissian, which can carry out this calculation for you. We'll post a link to Tissian in the supplementary materials page on the Complexity Explorer website.